Jesus, the bridegroom is an actual, an image of him being crowned with thorns and having his hands bound. So when you're talking about the extent of the love for the bridegroom and bride, like that's, that's how in iconography, how Jesus, the bridegroom is portrayed, which I always think is fascinating. And, um, yeah, kind of bold. Just like, it's not like this beautiful Jesus. It's not like this. No, it's Jesus scourged and, um, bound and crowned with thorns. Right, so the 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 extent of the love the bridegroom has for the bride is is obviously going to culminate like in the season of, of Lent in, in his passion and death. That's how much he loves his bride. Love, love is an exodus from me to you. Three, two, one. <laughs> 200, everybody. 200, everybody. Go. Make some noise. (laughs) Take a deep breath. Okay. And take a breath. I mean, it's not nothing. 200 episodes of the Poco, the Paco a Paco (laughs) podcast. (laughs) That's 200 hours. Guys, it's been a great journey. (laughs) You have an announcement? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the angels, you've been journey. wanting to make this <laughs> announcement for a long time. <laughs> well, a great journey, everyone. <laughs> There's you've no been, announcement. So. You've been There's, traded? <laughs> you've, I've been traded? I have been traded. I'm actually retired. You entered the tra- transfer <laughs> portal? Tra- tra- <laughs> I was thinking about the transfer portal. I wonder if anybody will have me out there. What if like, we swapped you for Michelle Benzinger? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or someone on Pints with Aquinas or... <laughs> What are the our Dominican friends? God's planning. Can we God's swap and <laughs> <laughs> they don't want me? What they if there was trust like me, a, they do not want me. What if there was like a podcast transfer portal? <laughs> you know, what I mean like we're shopping for oh, let's see if his father Josh Johnson. They come in and try out. They come and <laughs> try out. Kind of, yeah, we're, we're, so we're looking pretty strong at the quarterback position. So. <laughs> I, I would like you, yeah, that's I like this game actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Father John Johnson, yeah. Josh Johnson. So we got one Father Angelus. We're looking at Father Gregory Pine. We'll throw in Father Angelus. <laughs> yeah. we'll in the first round in. pick next year. <laughs> yeah, what else will we throw in? <laughs> oh man, like Father Josh fun. Johnson would spice this this up. That'd be mm-hmm. fun to, yeah. to have him on. This points me to a good a, a recent insight I've had. I've I've come across a good number of people from South Louisiana, including the dudes. They're just so much more fun and cooler than I am. I just can't hang. Mm. Father Josh is one of those guys. He's just fun and cool. And I'm just like. He's fun and cool. I can't keep up. But it's like a very South Louisiana thing. They're just like dudes and they're fun and they're like. He was funny. We were at the Napa conference together. I I hadn't laughed that much in a long time. He's funny. He doesn't listen to this podcast, but Father Josh is pretty great. Father Josh, turn on right now. We're talking about you. <laughs> he has listened to the podcast. <laughs> really? he's, wow. he's alluding to it. I don't know that he does, but he has. No, he has, he has bigger, bigger, bigger and better things to do. That's true. So 200 episodes, guys. Here we are. We've been through some stuff. All the places we've been. Ups and downs, the highs and lows. Still haven't gone on a cruise. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Mm-hmm. Still no cruise. People, people There's, have talked. People have said. What have they said? They want it. <laughs> chicken fingers and all. You know what I'm saying? Chicken fingers. All, all you can eat chicken <laughs> yeah. fingers. Cruise to Mexico to do mission work. Our Lady Guadalupe. Yep, Our Lady Guadalupe. And you got anything? We could have made a cruise in the desert. I was trying to make some cruise desert thing, but there's no water there. So. <laughs> anyway. We could all take camels. Pilgrimage. <laughs> anything else you guys want to <laughs> say? What did I, I, we were talking, I'm going to continue our last week's episode real quick. This is one of the things that I was thinking, I don't think I'm going to propose it, mm. but I don't, I'm not convinced, I'm not going to propose it, <laughs> but, but I'm still, still also, it. but you're still going to say, what not you should have an accountability, accountability partner for technology. Yes, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also not convinced it's a bad idea yet for a friary to do vigils during <laughs> Lent. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like vigils. Are we talking about vigils once a week? I think that's what, think, what, I think that's what I'm thinking. But it's yeah. like, the, but the idea, the, the mm-hmm. idea is, no, I don't think, I don't want to say any more about it. But anyway, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think part of it is just like a lot of people have natural vigils, you know, like they're up taking care of kids or something like that at night and they still got to go to work the next day. 
and it wouldn't be a yeah, bad idea true. to have some experience of that. I would hate it. It'd destroy me, but I don't think it's a terrible idea. I, unless you are taking care of kids at night <laughs> <laughs> at a friary, uh, we have a youth center and you're up late and then you have to get up within like five hours. And so, no, I just still, that was, I that was before it had nothing to do with our actual conversation, Okay, but I was, I was already thinking about it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I don't think we're going to do it. So, welcome everybody. Welcome, Father Mark Mary. I, w- I wish we could, and 200 episodes is a lot, mm-hmm. you know, but I wish there was like a highlight reel or like a best of, or, you or know what? we can go back to, we can go back to things that were edited out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where like, so top, <laughs> top three things that Ann said that got edited out. Yeah. I honestly don't remember what I would have said that got edited out. I think I burped once. <laughs> You, something had to do with coming after Tom Brady too hard. <laughs> I came after Tom Brady? <laughs> what are you talking about? I've never talked about Tom Brady in my life on this podcast. Not in the release version. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It what never got released. Tom Brady? I don't, I don't know. know. Are the microphones I think something on? about... <laughs> and we still know that. Anyway. But let's mm-hmm. <laughs> try to, yeah, we, like to, we try I to like get like at big, it again, and then you have to like. Yeah. The big dramatic buildup. You, all you have for me is Tom Brady. That's well. That's one that comes to mind. I think I compared you. I, I think I whole, might have said something demonic, and it's actually not, and that might have got walked back. <laughs> I have a couple of things about my for myself. Video that games I took and back. demonic. I brought up at one point. And you're like, can we just? Can we? <laughs> that's a strong take. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, "Can I just say this real quick?" That, <laughs> and then I always recant. I never like fight back i'm like yeah you got a point sorry (laughs) what even better than all of these things that could have happened what did happen is we got accountability partners (laughs) (laughs) father isaiah's song exodus has been released is that song number two (laughs) number two exodus it's number two does that track number two from the album mysteries and medicines has been released i've been waiting so long to find out what track number two is it's not track number two oh Oh, but it's the second release (laughs) Okay, it's the second release. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed your little taste of that and more of that to come. And this was a pretty not the best introduction to the two hundred. So no, I mean I feel good about it. What, what My, else can we do? You want? I have um, I have some some points of business for people in the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be fun. It sounds exhilarating. Hey, <laughs> if people are working, with, first of all. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, hey, I don't know. There's a lot of people who wear essential oils. Did you know that other people can smell them? Just so you know. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know. We've had some notes on this. We've had about essential oils. oils. Yeah. We're talking about essential oils right now. Two episode. Hey, guys. Great. <laughs> hey, by the way, it. essential well, oils. I got notes, bro. They stink. <laughs> I got Guatemala hurricane on there, or volcano on there, too, but we're not going to do that one. <laughs> Because we, you know, sometimes we have some guys who wear it and like, I don't know, because you like put it on for whatever reason. Just so you know, like if we're in the chapel together, I can smell your essential oil. Did you know that? Um, is this something, <laughs> do a lot of guys wear essential oils at your friary? It seems like a yeah. friary problem. No, yeah. but it's can happening. just take a time out for it's a not second? Not what, <laughs> what is happening? Is this really happening? <laughs> yeah, this is good stuff. This is kind of like. Hey, if you're working with somebody hot who's takes. doing you a favor or who is your boss, <laughs> And you're in a different time zone. When you set up a meeting with them, I would put it in their time zone, not your own time zone. Mm. Oh, that's another hot. Is this? So let's just do a hot take episode. I, 200 episode hot takes. That. I would say, like, whenever I'm working with somebody in a different time zone, I would put ET at the end of it. It's like my time zone, but I would put ET. Pretend you were organizing something with the bishop in Oakland. Oh, that's different. Then he's, what would you do? He's a bishop. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm going to defer to him. So what are you going to put in the thing? Hey, I always put both. Bishop, I'm available to talk at... Yeah, actually, no, I mean, I put ET. I think so. Would you put his and yours? I would put... That's what I do. I always say, Bishop, I'm available to talk about this at your time and this is... Which is my my time. I'm just that's small time I mean. here. I don't talk to bishops. But I know you reference it. I don't it. talk to bishops either. You reference it to your boss, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So... I think... Because you don't want to make them have to do the work of figuring it out. <laughs> I talked to her... Uh, like a consulting firm recently and this lady does this all the time there's like an app you can get that just like does it for you 
it like writes the email so it like clearly like what time zone you're working in and just like spits it out so you that's uh it does both i think i don't think oh, i tracked that all you gotta do you don't is, track it i said i don't think i, I don't think i totally tracked what you, <laughs> no i was <laughs> thank you thank you now i can take you seriously <laughs> well, no i think i was if like you this lady works in like international business and so she forgets like time zones and there's an app she uses where it helps you correspond with people in different time zones and so I, w- I think there. she said that there's like both, or at least I got the email. She lives in California. Mm-hmm. She's like, I'll be available. This this is my time. This is your time. Mm-hmm. And she said an app does it for her. Yeah. I talked to another friar who's in a different time zone, and I just Google real quick. That's what I do sometimes as well. Uh, whatever time in this time place, or in this place, and Google tells me. And I put both of our time zones. Yeah. And so I'll say, hey, I'm available this time, your time, this time, my time. I think that's a good courtesy. Well, what's what's next? I mean, it's all right. Like what a, else you got? Hot, hot takes. takes. Let's go. Let's great. Two hundred episodes. Mm-hmm. I got Calendly. Just started using it. You did. If you're, if you, if I'm a vocation visitor, mm. and I'm trying to get a meeting with you, the vocation director, what's not helpful is for me to send you a, hey, can you sign? I would like to talk. Can you oh, set up with my Calendly? Definitely not the. Um, I probably wouldn't even do it as the vocation director with the vocation guys. Calendly, for people who don't know, is a thing that like helps to coordinate schedules, and it can be used well or it can be used not well. Yeah. <laughs> Recently, someone said, "Hey, you know, probably you know, probably be easiest, uh, probably the probably help coordinate the event. It'd probably easiest to use uh, Calendly. Would you be able to find it? Fill it? You want to just check that out here? That was a great way to propose it. But it's like, hey, I yeah. want you to do something for me. Sign up for Calendly. Nah, that's true. I'm not going to sign up for it." And I only say this because I've heard this from some other people. Hmm. So there well, we go. Those else are my. Got? What else you got? No, those, those are the only things because I think someone's got a the time zones things. I think it's good to, for people to know that the calendly thing. Essential, essential oils, baby. I, Come I, on, I'm, so, I'm self conscious about essential. I'm not attacking anybody. I just don't. I think you get used to it. I just, I want you to know. But that's like it's not just oils. Then it's like perfume. It's different things like that right but the uh, but like because i i think you put the i don't know totally but i think you put the oil on because like it's supposed to help in some way uh-huh. not for the, like the perfume and cologne is put on for to for be that. to smell good right but you know there's a smell with the essential oil right that's, that's why i don't know maybe what do you mean maybe do I oils not smell i don't just don't know if like you're aware that like if because you get used to it yeah, but if I'm consciously putting something on my wrist, or I don't know how people put on such oils like on their foreheads, or whatever. I'm sorry, it's not, I don't want to be the meaning with this. But like, wouldn't you smell something? Or am, am I am I missing this? But by you smelling it, would you be clearly aware that other people can as well? I think so. All right. Well, maybe it was a stupid announcement. <laughs> <I don't think>. <laughs> <laughs> maybe people aren't. Anyway, those are just, you know, because, you know, I'm out here. Sometimes you got to tell somebody they got, you know, food in their teeth. And, you know, if you're doing the time zone thing and people are feeling disrespected, I just want to help people out, you know? You're, sure. you're doing it. I feel I was like. trying to hear to use my Your 200th platform. episode. Your platform. Use, I'm just trying to use my platform for the, the common Your 200, good. 200 episode. I'm trying to build the culture platform. of life here. Oh. All right. Well, don't know how that went. But. <laughs> But here's what we're doing. We're back into Lent, friends. That was probably penitential. <laughs> For everybody. Second, second. No, that's fine. You got to spice it up a little bit. Good little novelty. All right. Um. So the second episode is taken from the uh, Father Mark Toops' theme on Christ as the bridegroom. And I think... It's a really great topic. And uh, right. So last week we kind of established that it is about Jesus and all of our practices being oriented to him. I think now also now like there's a, there's an, there is just a reality that throughout salvation history that continues today is that um, right. The desert is a, is a place where God betrothes us to him and he betrothes himself to us. That there is a um, like, there's a spousal uh, sort of betrothal component to the desert and um and i think that's just a beautiful thing to remind us of as we as we go into lent and to keep that before us as we keep our lent about jesus so this is uh, again the quote that he chooses which i which is great um isaiah 62 5 as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your god rejoice over you again this kind of explicit um 
what's the word where you make one thing like that? The explicit comparison of God to a bridegroom. And then this is the a re- really common, uh, commonly quoted Lenten scripture from Hosea. So this is Hosea 2.14 and then 19. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. So um, I'm going to kick it out to you guys. Just anything on Christ as bridegroom, and particularly the um, the desert as being the place of betrothal. I'll let Desert Boy start. <laughs> Desert Boy! <laughs> One word. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> it's the same one. It's the same joke I've been using for the past two or three episodes. Um, <clears throat> so I think, actually, just it's, it's kind of simple, but I do think that it's Christ. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm taking I, my sweatshirt I, off. What's I, I gave him a hard time before, but about this, taking the sweatshirt and putting it back on. That's all. And he just I'm took sorry. it off again. Yeah, yeah. But please, sorry. You're right over there. Doing great. <laughs> you guys are ruining the 200th episode. <laughs> so I think it's it's a bit provocative, and I think sometimes if I could speak just generally, and I don't want to like project, but sometimes I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians, have a hard time understanding Jesus as bridegroom, like in and how we're supposed to enter this relationship, um, like as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so our God will rejoice over you, right? So. You know, yes, it's the chosen people that God betrothes to himself, but it's also individual, each individual soul that God wants to be the bridegroom. He wants to come and have like a singular love and he wants to be captivated. Everything that a bride and bridegroom share together in, in context of the way, um, and this is what I want to say, the quality of love, like everything that, that like it expresses who God is. Like you, yeah, that's, a, that's what I want to say. Like, Jesus said bridegroom reveals a, a quality of love of the way that God loves, right? And I think it's hard because like, uh, you know, especially especially for men, it's like, it's hard to be like, wow, like how do I, how do I let Jesus love me as someone who who is a lover or a beloved? Mm-hmm. I think sometimes that obviously there's, there's, um, there's something natural that's like, oh, it's like, kind of hard for me to understand, right? So I think it's just good to start there that that is kind of provocative but but i think it's actually good to wrestle with because what we're talking about is as jesus is bridegroom he want he comes after every soul to love us as the chosen one as the beloved as as like a bride where jesus is like i have given up everything for you i have a singular love for you you captivate me like every every um in different ways that the bride and bridegroom like love each other and this is all throughout scripture Right, this is a huge thing in the Old Testament that God pursues His people um, as 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 like as the bridegroom, as the one that I mean, you know, the, I think it's in Isaiah that like I will espouse you to myself, like I like I you know as a as a as a bride marries a bridegroom, so your builder will marry you. Like that's that's in Isaiah. I mean, that's like that's bridal la- that's spousal bridal language. Like He's not saying he, He's it's it's. God is revealing a quality of love, right? And obviously it's analogous, right? And but but it it, it does still say something about the way that, that Jesus wants to love us. Um, I do think it's just probably good to start that it is provocative and it could be hard to understand, but I do think it's it, it's biblical and it's personal and intimate. And so I think it's just good to kind of wrestle with like what does that mean for the way that Jesus loves me? Yeah. And I think there's life here. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but one of the more commentated books by the church fathers is a song of songs, right? Which has a lot of bridal a lot. and spousal imagery. Right. And like, if you just read the song of songs, it's just kind of like, Oh, what's going on here? There's just a lot of my beloved's eyes are like a dove. Like, okay. <clears throat> like that doesn't do anything for me, but it's helpful if you have like a, some sort of commentary just to see, cause there's a way I think, it might be the Jerusalem Bible that breaks it down because like it's actually it's a dialogue between the beloved and the lover and the beloved being God and the, and the lover being uh, us or Israel. Right. And so then it becomes this dialogue between God and us. 
And then we can receive the words that, that the beloved is saying about us. And it just changed, I think, the way we read the scriptures. But, but once again, the heart of, of God is to encounter us in this way that sometimes can be somewhat scandalous to us. Like, oh, God's going to be that close to me? Like, ooh, <laughs> you know, like, I don't want him to be that close to me type of thing, you know? But, um, but that's his heart for us. Like, he doesn't want any separation from us. He wants to be completely with us. And we can sometimes, as you're mentioning, struggle with this idea that, Jesus is going to be my spouse or like there's this whole spousal component to my relationship with God. Um, and just to be uncomfortable in the mystery there just to, okay, like, Lord, you have to show me this. I don't, I have no idea how this is supposed to play out my practical life. Am I supposed to like, whatever it is, like and bring the struggles to him because the truth is that he does desire to pursue you. He does desire to to be with you. He does desire to, to speak tenderly to you. Um, and the, the, the desert in particular is this place where, once again, as we journey into this place of being stripped of of having nothing and relying, as I mentioned last time, leaning on our beloved, coming from the desert, uh, it's a place that we can experience. Okay, God is enough for me, and so maybe we'll talk about this. But the same way that a man leaves his family and a wife leaves her family to become one, in the same way in the desert, this happens where <clears throat> there's a place of encounter uh, between two people, and obviously it's your heart and the Lord's heart. And so, just to I think take it from there as far as the Lord just encou- desires to encounter your heart in this in this different way and, and maybe even a way in which you never even imagined. But because he pursues you constantly and desires to, to speak lovingly to you, um, he will bring you into this place that's just foreign. Um, so that way, that foreignness isn't what separates you, but even more so, it could speak to his love for you. Two things. <coughs> huh. Um, the first thing, I think it's Psalm 19 and it's, it comes up in um, office readings, but it's like the, the bridegroom comes forth from his tent um, and it, that talks about like the, his love, like it will be nothing like a burning or nothing will be concealed from its burning heat. Right. So it's another image. And I it just like you guys have both used the word, but like the intensity, the pursuit, the urgency, it's just beautiful. It's like we to have a, like a contemplative space during this time to really let that sink in. Like Jesus coming forth from his tent as bridegroom, pursuing his bride, I, the old Jewish right, that bridegroom and the bride were separated and the bridegroom coming forth from his tent to go pursue his bride, to go go into that that space, which is just really powerful. And then again, nothing concealed from his burning heat. You're like, whoa, from the furthest end of the sky to the rising of the sun to its setting, nothing is concealed. Like, well, okay, that's like, that. there's an urgency there. There's a passion there, you know? And so in, in this like quality of love, like what does it mean to experience God's like burning passion um, for us as bridegroom would have for bride? Um, Secondly, when you, in iconography, Jesus, the bridegroom, is an actual an image of him being crowned with thorns and having his hands bound. So when you're talking about the extent of the love for the bridegroom and bride, like that's that's how in iconography, how Jesus, the bridegroom, is portrayed, which I always think is fascinating and, um, yeah, kind of bold. Just like it's not like this beautiful Jesus. It's not like this. No, it's Jesus scourged and um, bound and crowned with thorns. Right, so the 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 extent of the love the bridegroom has for the bride is is obviously going to culminate like in the season of, of Lent in, in his passion and death. That's how much he loves his bride, um, and so to keep that before us, that's that's the um, yeah, that's the flavor of the bridegroom's love for for the bride. Complete gift, complete self offering, um, and death of ultimately of of himself. Right, so just beautiful. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I think that, or one component of how, why the desert is the place of betrothal, in in place of encounter with at the bridegroom, right, is it is also it's a place in which uh, the Lord lures us to, um, basically just like basically to, to to uproot the idols out of our lives. Like it's a place also of destroying the idols. And the imagery, right, is that that our idols become something of like they become like our. Um, if you will, like the the object of, of like it's an internal, like um, not just idolatry, but like an adultery. Like there's a way in which we have, we are, our, our heart is meant to be given to him in an undivided fashion, but we've given it to these other, uh, we've been allured into temptation. We've given our heart to these other, um, these idols ultimately. And I think some of the idols, right? And so those are, those are then detriments to our capacity to be totally betrothed to him. And some of the idols that I think of that come to mind are um, like self-protection or self-fulfillment or self-actualization, self <laughs> self-reliance. 
these ways in which we are trying to take care of ourselves, trying to fulfill ourselves. Um, right. I think those, those are, those are real idols. Right. And, um, and in a sense, like they can be the object of like an idolatrous or <coughs> adulterous spirit and heart. And, and the Lord is, invitation to the desert is an invitation away from um, these idols and, and a, a greater kind of receptivity and dependence on him so that he can have all of us. Um, all right, before kind of slightly kind of shifting our approach to this, did you guys have anything more just kind of on the topic as we're talking about it? Just a quick, I, I've yeah. been recently praying with uh, Elijah in the Prophets by All and like that whole scene of like competition of who the God will bring fire and things. And mm -hmm. I, there was this one line that kind of stuck on me recently, like the Prophets by All do their own thing. They dance around, they're trying to get the, the, the fire to come and and then it's it shifts to elijah and it there's this beautiful line it, before elijah did his thing he said it said he rebuilt the altar mm. he rebuilt the altar and then he put the sacrifice around it and then god came into this thing and so i've just been stuck with that line he rebuilt the altar and so when you're talking about idolatry when you're talking about idolatry when you're talking about going to the desert like to rebuild the altar <laughs> means to rebuild the place to offer sacrifice and worship you know, and so that that could be a beautiful image for Lent. Like, what does it actually mean to, to acknowledge the idols, but also then to rebuild the the altar of worship and adoration and, and praise of God and putting God back at the center rather than the idols? Um, subtle but beautiful, just like to rebuild that so I can worship well, so I can receive what it, what He wants to give me rather than kind of having my all idolatry or my adultery kind of lead lead me to a bit of a mess. Do you have a sense of what that means to rebuild the altar? Um, yeah, like, um, this could be like the reality of like my idolatry takes me, maybe takes up my time, takes up my space, takes up my, like, so uh, what I listen to, what I watch, all those things, it's rebuild the altar is putting the, the idols aside and then rebuilding times of prayer, rebuilding my sacramental life, rebuilding my contemplative life. And so rebuilding the altar means, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to focus more on my relationship with God and maybe rebuilding the altar means, okay, I'm going to go to mass every day, or I'm going to, instead of like all this other stuff, I'm going to reset my priority back to my, um, you know, meditation time in the morning before work. That's a rebuilding, putting that stuff back in relationship in right order. And, but again, like you said, it, you have to, it takes a, a serious conversation about removing the idols or the other forms of worship. So that the altar, if you will, of adoration and praise and my experience of God can be rightly ordered. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cause I think, um, do you remember where that, like what scriptures that is specifically? What chapter, book and chapter? I could look it up. Yeah, I think it's sec it. first, second, first. I think Kings. it's second Kings. Second Kings. Kings. Cause I think those, that's a great kind of um, throwback to some of what we were talking about last week, right? Cause the prophets of Baal are doing all this sort of intense, crazy, wild all stuff, but it's not what the Lord wants. And it's kind of just like, it's just not it, right? But what, is it Elijah? Yeah. Yeah, Elijah, what yeah. Elijah does is in some ways quite sort of ordinary, but it's what the Lord wanted. And it's ultimately like, was yeah. the, it was like the right thing. So that could be a cool thing to kind of go back to. Maybe it's, uh, for, maybe it's first Kings. Uh, sorry. Widow. Uh, Trials <laughs> over the prophet of the Baal. You're looking for the specific. Just the, the book and chapter is fine. So Elijah is in first Kings 18. That's the story it. of it is 20, 1820 to 30 1820 to 40 cool yeah rebuild the altar i like it if i'm honest <laughs> father mark married a lot of a lot of um yeah i will probably say specifically what i really like think about but like i think in general we do a lot of like okay i have the recipe i have this i have that and we then we kind of just do a lot of this kind of stuff to try to bring on uh, growth or maturity or healing or going deeper and sometimes you're just like well i just kind of danced around for the last you know a year of my life and the fire didn't really come because my disposition is not of god right so sometimes it's like the simplicity of moving back and like okay totally god brings yeah. the fire and i just have to offer the sacrifice i don't have to or act, rebuild the altar and rebuild the altar and offer the sacrifice and that's very simple compared to like slashing around and <laughs> yeah. you know and, and i'm kind of being funny there but, just but like, no i get it mm -hmm. It's, it's verse 30 that you're referencing. 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30. But the whole story is 18, chapter 18, verse 20 to 40. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you, Father Isaiah. Or Father Isaiah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Father Isaiah, new song, Exodus, out now. Um, <laughs> 
Exodus Let's get him where, in the transfer portal. Father yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exodus is where the Lord brought people out to strip them from their idolatry. Because mm. mm. they're in Egypt. The, and it's the, the, the hook is love is an exodus from me to you. Mm. Mm. Right. But just to say <laughs> about that, um, I think even in human relationships, right, when we fall in love with somebody and then we take the next step of marriage, no longer are we in our own silo and like protected from like certain things, but we necessarily have to be um, share things with them. Um, like no relationship, specifically marriage, lasts on hiding things or, or being hidden. And so the same way too with the Lord, like the deeper we go in relationship with him, the less things we can hide or hide from him. Uh, we just have to share it freely. And so he desires to strip those things, those idols, those adulterous ways, and for us to be faithful to him. And so the desert is a place of just exposing ourselves as we are and allowing the Lord to love us there. And so that's it. And the contribution. Thank you. Speaking of fire, mm. Father Mark Toops is fire. Mm. And this is this is what he does here is the type of thing that gets me pumped. Uh it's just super creative. Do you want I know. <laughs> Father Pierre Toussaint just had a temptation to pick up the air horn and the blow it and then he resisted. Good I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But anyway, here's what Father, so Father Toops is like, hey, well, you know what? We're talking about Jesus as the bridegroom, the bridegroom Messiah. You know what? Let's see what there is for us in the rite of matrimony. Yes, that's so clever. Insightful. I love that. I just think that it's like genius. Nice one, Father Toops. All right. Um, and so he he like basically proposes to us, and I think it's a great thing, like some of the, the rite of matrimony and hearing Jesus sort of say this towards us, I think is really I can't, yeah, kind of powerful. Um, so I'll just kind of uh, share the example here that he has. Um, before the exchange of, of vows, for example, couples are asked, have you come here to, to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? Jesus would respond, yes. And in John 10, 17 to 18, he says, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. And have power to take it up, like take it again. Father Mark Toops' words, there is no coercion. Jesus is free, freely and wholeheartedly. He gives himself to us. And I just think that that like Jesus seeing us, knowing us, and freely and wholeheartedly um choosing us uh as a bridegroom does to the bride. I just think it's yeah, powerful and beautiful. So but and then yeah, before going on to the next thing, which kind of is a slight change of tenor. Anything on that? I mean, again, I think it just makes it really personal. Yeah. Like he he doesn't, um, there's no co- coercion. Jesus is free, but he's free to choose me or he's free to choose. Like there, there's such a, again, it's a personal quality. I think we're talking about a the bridegroom has a quality of love that he doesn't have to do this, but he chooses to lay his life down for me. Mm-hmm. Um. And, and so I, I, maybe hopefully this like fits, I think it does, but I mean, we're talking about the desert where that's going to culminate in the cross. Um, but like, this is, and again, he does this so freely, but he's like, he, in the last supper in the cross, he, we have the bridegroom like in, in its, in, in his perfection of love saying like, this is my body. Remember like, this is provocative, but it's true. Like, like the bridegroom is like hanging on the cross naked and like that that's why the, the offering of the eucharist and the offering of the cross are like this is my body this is the way that i love you um and that's why it's connected to matrimony right because it's the gift of 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 love is that the husband and wife say like this is i laid down my life freely like this is my body in the great in the in the gift of of the intimacy of marriage but like that's like i i don't have to i make us my like i make myself a gift of love but the bridegroom on the cross, Jesus is saying like, I give you everything and I give it to you. And I don't, again, it's, it's the quality of love, the quality of freedom um, to say like, this is how much I love you personally. Um, and I think it's just really beautiful. Um, I mean, to say the least, but, but I do think on the, on <coughs> it's the last supper, it's the cross that give us any pretty, pretty, incredible glimpse of the way the bridegroom loves in this freedom. Like I give my, I give my life for you. I give my body. This is my body for you. Beautiful. No, I don't have anything. It is awesome. 
I mean, I have stuff to say, but it's more along the second <clears throat> quote. Do you want to so. do you want to send us in that direction? Sure. And so, the idea is, um, like once again, his choice is for us. His choice is like, I see you, I know you, I love you, and and right, like real love and true love is free, faithful, fruitful, and total, which is Jesus' love for us. And I think oftentimes we can sit in this place of like, but why me? Or like, I have these things that are wrong with me. And um, we may now put on like, once again, the human aspect of, um, I have to fix these things before he's able to love me. But like, once again, he he chooses you and he desires to lay down his life for you. And just to, to first of all, rest in that gift um, because he's faithful, you know? So despite what we'll talk about in this quote, like the sickness or the way in which you're unable to love him back perfectly, like it's okay because he's not going anywhere. Like he's not scared of you being unable to do certain things in the way that you think it should happen. Uh, but what actually attracts him to us is is that that part that we don't like about ourselves or, or those things that we think are, yeah, are shameful. And so it'd be like, as uh, you know, a guy who finds this woman attractive and she's like, oh, like, I just don't like this part of me. He's like, but that's what drives me crazy about you. You know, like, mm-hmm. I like the fact that you're shy. I like the fact that whatever it is, I think sometimes that's, that's Jesus' heart for us too. We're like, I just like... It, it bothers me Jesus, that this thing is a part of my life. He's like, no, 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 I, I'm here for that too. Like, I don't want you despite those things. And so, and this is what he does as far as laying himself down freely for us, where he's, he always says, my choice is for you and I love you and I'm wholeheartedly yours. Um, so can you give me your whole heart in this endeavor, which is a beautiful relationship, but even more so it's intimate and it's, and it's every aspect of our lives he desires to have because he's faithful. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to be discouraged by our yeah, our lack of being able to do something. Um, he's eternally patient with us and his heart is for us so we can be eternally with him. And so just to rest in that in that, in that that place. I do really appreciate, I, I feel like there could be a lot of value to going back. You know, I, I think one, you know, there's reality that there are a number of our listeners who are not in a, uh, a marriage relationship and they would like to be. And to experience the reality and the truth of how Jesus is bridegroom to your soul, I think is uh, kind of could be a, a particularly valuable practice for the spiritual life. And even going to these, to the, to the, the, the words of the right and praying with Jesus, saying these words to you, I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love you and to honor you all the days of my life. I, don't know, I think that's, yeah, I don't know. I think it's moving. I think it's beautiful. And I think it's true. And and as Father PT said, you know, um, which is kind of a changing slightly, again, the approach to this is like, I came not for the righteous, but sinners and, and you know, not not for the healthy, but the, the sinner uh, or the sick. Mm-hmm. Um, there is just that reality that those places of poverty, of weakness, of vulnerability, of struggle, even of shame um, are draw him to us even more than the strengths. And um, I think that's just true. I think it's really good news. And I think that's something that Jesus allows us to enter into the desert of our own struggle and inability so that he can, he can love us there and meet us in the poverty and meet us in the struggle and meet us in the dependence so that we can experience fully in reality that he, even there, uh, and in particularly there, betroths himself to us and chooses us freely, w- knowingly, without coercion, wholeheartedly. So that's some that's some good news. Mm-hmm. And to say, like, once again, it's consistent with the gospel. It's consistent with how he loves us. Um, like, hey, Zacchaeus, I must come to your house, even though you're tax collector. People are grumbling, like, does he know what kind of guy this guy Zacchaeus is? The Samaritan woman, he goes purposely to, purposely to the well. The woman caught in adultery. He says, hey, look, has anybody else accused you? So, like, there are these places where, once again, just to, to reject the lie of Satan, to say that I have to fix myself before I can approach Jesus because he's with you, he's faithful, and he loves you. And he desires, once again, to, for you to first experience that love, for you first to be in an intimate relationship with him, and then <clears throat> move from the place with him, from this place of shame, from this place of difficulty, as opposed to first thinking, I just got to rearrange everything before he comes. And so, um, so yeah, so once again, just felt the need to say that. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't have my view, my blind, my blind to you. Sorry, Father Angels. Um, again, this might sound a bit random, but like, remember that one of the main images of heaven is a wedding feast. And so again, it just, it, it, we, we talk about Jesus loving us, like in the, in the context of like, of matrimony, of, of the, the wedding vows and things like that. 
<clears throat> and I think it's just very beautiful. Again, I don't think we have to like defend Jesus as bridegroom, but I think it might be new for people. But just to remember mm-hmm. that like in in the scriptures, in St. Paul, uh, St. Paul talks about um, the church's bride and Jesus laying down his life. And then it goes through, you know, Revelation is it's, it's the wedding feast of the lamb, right? Is that uh, it's just such a, it's such a, a, a tender, beautiful full experience of, of the way that God is going to love every soul for all eternity is going, going to be a wedding banquet where, you know, the bridegroom sits on the throne, you know? So I just think it's beautiful to know that like, this is, it's so steeped in scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is like what happens and this is like his love as it transforms us. Like where we're invited to, to live in this place with like, as bride, as like kind of as a bride, as we like enter into heaven. Right. So again, I, I just am throwing that out there that, this is worthy of our time. Mm. This is worthy of, of spending time during Lent to say, Jesus, like, this is how you love me. And to enter that mystery, like Father PT said at the beginning of like, wow, like you love me as bridegroom. Like that, how does that make you feel? Like, <laughs> and can we, can we enter that space and receive deeply? Just a, a, a nuanced, like proposal of the, the idolatry or adultery. Like the, the reality is, is that I think throughout all history, Israel was well, was aware of the idolatry. They were aware of what they were doing, but they just couldn't figure it out. They just couldn't like, oh yeah, I'm going to repent now. It's going to be all better. And so I think the the bridegroom comes because like you said, like, because I don't have to like fully repent. Oh, or I, I, I'm trying and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better and I'm trying not to do that. But like the, the cross is an ultimate, like, okay, I'll have to do it for you. Like I will take on the burden. I will take on the idolatry. I will take on the adultery for you. And so I can unburden that from from your whole history, which is I, I try and then I fail and then I worship idols and then I try again and then like, and so we can't actually do that. We can't actually rid of ourselves of the idols on our own. And that was that was why Jesus came, and that was why the cross ultimately comes. This like He officially undoes the the burden that we carry that we can't undo ourselves, right? And so oftentimes too is just like again not me and self focus and self reliance, but like I actually can't do this, Lord. It's beyond me. It's beyond me. And the cross actually comes and does what I can't do myself. And the resurrection is, is the answer to like, I'm trying, but it's, I will always be unfaithful. I will always worship other things. I will always, you know, and so it's beautiful just like to feel like the Zacchaeus moment where just like, wow, I'm, I'm a a tax collector, but he still comes to me. I'm a prostitute and he still comes to me. Mm -hmm. I'm a leper and he still comes to me because that's what, that's the answer that Jesus gives us. Um, and then he gently invites us to repent and he gently invites us to redemption, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I'm just, as the more goes on, he's like, whoa, that's it. Like we can't do it. Mm-hmm. We've been being idolaters for all of history. Mm-hmm. And it just, at some point we fall short, you know? And so that's what I think Jesus' answer is the bridegroom coming for his bride to show us ultimately what it means uh, to be loved and redeemed. Mm-hmm. And it's, and this is, I don't know if a departure from previous points, but it's not generic also. It's not like there's this generic love story that God wants to have with us that, that unfolds the same way as Zacchaeus and the Samaritan woman. I think there are aspects of it, but at the same time, like he has a particular love story for you. Um, just like it'd be foolish for married couples to compare their relationship with other married couples because there's a whole set of life and circumstances that other couples don't have to deal with. You could point, you could look at it and say, wow, how beautiful they love each other. But then it's kind of a foolish thing to say, oh, our love has to look the same way as theirs. Or you want a certain, your marriage to look like somebody else's if you're hoping to get married type of thing, where the Lord has a particular love for you, particularly in your struggle, but also your relationship with him and your story with him will be very, very different mm-hmm. than everybody else. Because once again, you're unique and there is this reality that he's come to marry you, that he comes to be, he's come to be your spouse, not like generically everybody's spouse, but specifically your spouse in your, the place where you find yourself in your life. Great. Thank you. You're welcome, <laughs> welcome Paul Mark Marie. <laughs> 200 episodes. This, this is still the 200th episode, right? This is still the 200th episode. This is 203 now. <laughs> Come pr- pr- pray us into our last one, Father Innocent. Okay, I will pray us into our last one. I prayed last time, but I'm very happy <laughs> this time. But I was actually just, I think, I mean, I don't think no one asked me to do this, but um, I mean, I, I do think it's worth saying that we have deeply grateful hearts that we can do this. Mm. We recognize that um, that God is doing something, and we're just humbled and grateful. And when we hear the feedback that it's it's like it's actually helping people pray and go deeper with the Lord, that's like all we desire. Um, and so, I think we're just grateful for that. Thanks, you think we're just grateful for Rob. We're grateful for all the people who listen. Um, and 
I just think it's think yeah, we're just grateful to the Lord that this is a work of God and mm-hmm. this is the only way we can do it right because he's doing something and we recognize that and we're humbled by that um, but we have grateful hearts in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and amen. amen Jesus we thank you we thank you for everything we thank you for the way you love us and we thank you for being the bridegroom um, the bridegroom of our hearts um, who who turn to us and and give himself to us and 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 vow in this in this way to to be with us and to never leave us and to forgive us and to love us. Um, we just thank you for constantly giving us yourself and giving us new life. And we just ask that during this Lenten season that we could experience the deep way that you love us and set your heart on us. Um, and you would just clear a, a space for this new intimacy. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. And as I was going to say after our <laughs> prayer, closing the episode, just want you guys to know I'm really <laughs> grateful. I didn't mean to step on anybody. <laughs> nope. um, but thank you, Father Innocent. Thank you, Father Angelus. Thank you, Father PT, for being a part of this. Thank you, Father Mary, for thank you, Father, making for it making it happen. to do it. Mm-hmm. So thank you. And um, to uh, also to go back to what Father Innocent said, just thank you again to Rob in particular for him and his team making this possible, for taking, making it, yeah, just kind of carrying the, the large burden of this particularly early on and um, just in a lot of different ways. So thank you, everybody. Looking forward to 200 more hands. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you to the editing team. Thank you to the editing team. <laughs> Chris, we love you. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> that was funny. And um, <laughs> thank you all for your nice gift to celebrate 200 episodes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, I meant, <laughs> well, I meant thank you. Money. Well, oh, well, I see. I see. Fundraising, I bro. Thought, like, hey, look, thank cool. you to all of our benefactors for do making little, it possible. Do a little cruise Happy to 200. celebrate. <laughs> Peace, y'all. All right, guys. <laughs> love, love is an exodus. Love is an exodus from me to you. In the Egypt of myself, sent away.